All right. So everybody has a handout for today on pain therapeutics. There's a couple extras here. So today what we're going to be covering is how to manage pain without pharmaceuticals. But we have to remember that this class doesn't authorize us to prescribe, unprescribe, treat, medically diagnose, or give medical advice unless you have a license to do so. Um, this is for ourselves. This is for assisting people who we know and who we love, unless you are moving towards being able to do pharmaceuticals or non-pharmaceuticals. So as holistic health advisors, you are advising rather than diagnosing or treating, okay? But this class, we're gonna have a really great overview on a lot of different methods to control pain without pharmaceuticals. We're gonna talk about Ayurvedic methods. We're gonna talk about non-Ayurvedic methods. In the end of class, we're going to actually make a pain pulpily and show you how to use it. So when I studied at American University Complementary Medicine, one of the big things we did is we did pain treatments. So there's a lot of different types of pain treatment pulpilies that can be made and used on people, but this one is my absolute favorite one. So let's go ahead and pull the slides up here. Janice, can you see the slides okay? Yes. All right, wonderful. And everybody has a handout? Beautiful. So the first thing I wanna go over is how much pain affects people. Being in the medical profession, most of my patients are dealing with some type of pain issue. Whether they're taking Tylenol, ibuprofen, narco, fentanyl patches, or whether or not they're even getting pain relief from these high levels of pain reliever pills. And when they're taking all of these different pills, whether it's Tylenol, ibuprofen, naproxen, Norco, Tylenol with codeine, or bumming it off the corner in San Bernardino, we have to consider the fact that they have gastrointestinal problems with it, bleeding ulcers as a result from too much NSAIDs in their belly. They have problems with constipation. They have problems with dry mouth, blurriness. They have problems with instability, lack of balance. You know, when you doped out on Norco, it's kind of hard to keep balance perfect all the time. And they're in such high levels of pain. It's not like we're dealing with junkies. We're dealing with regular people like you and I who have unbearable pain. So what happens is they're always chasing the pain relief of their medication. And so this class is going to give us a wide view of alternative things that can be advised for people to do, as well as show you how to do some really deep, deep pain relief treatments. Okay. So we all know what pain is. It's a negative stimuli, right? I don't know many people who get pain from, let's say, stubbing their toe and they say, all right. So it's typically associated with a negative stimuli. It motivates you through your neurological nervous system to withdraw from what has caused you that pain, right? You put your hand on a hot stove, your nervous system says, ouch, and you withdraw your hand. But the problem is, is what if it's internal and it's chronic and you can't withdraw from it, then you're stuck living with it. A lot of the doctors at the hospital, their best advice to the patient, learn to live with it. I remember about 12 years ago, I was doing a permanent and stationary report on one of my workman's comp patients and discharging her. And she had severe carpal tunnel. She was not a surgical candidate because she had other comorbidities that prevented her from being able to go under anesthesia. 
She had gotten cortisone injections, physical therapy, braces, medications till her stomach was upset, the whole nine yards. And as I was closing her case, she said to me, is this the best I'm ever going to get? And my answer then was, yes, this is the best you're ever going to get. Today, that would not be my answer. Today, I would have a whole different tool chest of things for her to try, consider, explore. It doesn't mean that I'm going to do it in the office necessarily. I'm not going to whip out an aranda totally and start working on her in the office. But we know how to do it, how to instruct her how to do it. And I'll actually be recording the video later on of how to make it so that you all can have a copy of that. I should be able to upload it to YouTube. Fingers crossed. All technological <laughs> things are coordinated. So we know that um, pain is a sensation. It is also subjective and individualized. My 10 out of 10 pain scale might be your one out of 10 pain scale. Your three out of 10 pain scale could be my 10 out of 10. A lot of people who are in pain aren't believed. They're told, oh, you're exaggerating. Oh, you're making it up oh, you're overreacting, or you're a big baby, or better yet, you're just a drug seeker, right? So we have to always acknowledge and honor what people say their pain level is. My pain tolerance is extremely high. It's not fair for me to judge other people's pain off of my pain tolerance. And the same goes for medical professionals and non-licensed medical so it really varies. Yes? Um, that's a good question. So the question was, why do some people have higher pain tolerance than others? One, it can be their neurological system and their nervous system. But from what I have found, it's usually how much pain have you gone through and how much have you tolerated in the past and how did you learn how to cope with so I've had people come in a little sprained to the wrist. And they're, I mean, they're like a 10 out of 10 pain. And they'll share with me, I've never injured anything before. Whereas if you've got somebody like me, I've broken probably close to a dozen bones. And I'm going to be like this, that nah, hurts. Because I've learned how to cope and deal with or if you ask a woman who's had live birth, they're gonna be like, oh, I can handle this sprained wrist. I've handled much worse. But it doesn't always work that way. Some people have a much different threshold and it can depend on the emotions and experience around pain, what has been their um, treatment or non-treatment of pain, and it also has to do with the way the emotions respond. So for instance, if you have a, let's just go with an animal, a dog who has been repeatedly harmed. If they are barely touched, they'll scream. Because they've learned that pain is something terrible. So it just, it, there's a lot of complex psychological Yes. You know, one thing I'd add is, you know, when you're going to bed, if someone says they're in pain and they're walking, it doesn't mean they're not in pain. But if they're in pain and they come back from sleep, it doesn't mean that they're not in pain. True. It's just potentially their way of coping with it. That's a big judgment. Yeah. Just like when somebody loses someone and maybe they're not coming in. It's very. Janice, can you hear Aaron talking? Yeah. Okay, good.
dollars for the pain pill. Yeah. And this medicine. It's so pain management, right alternative pain so, management is very it's important. So important. Very important. Really especially now the DEA has cracked down so hard. If I prescribe more than seven days of a narcotic, I have to go online, check the DEA cures report, make sure they're not getting meds from elsewhere, or I'm liable now. So, all right. So we already talked about um, what the class aim is. Let's talk a little bit about actual pain pathway, okay? So we know that when pain is experienced, it moves through what's called slow, unmyelinated C fibers, as well as fast myelinated A fibers. This signal is carried through the afferent nerve fibers in the human body or animal body to what's called the dorsal ganglion of the spinal cord, then eventually to the brain stem, to the cerebellum, and then to what's called the somatosensory cortex, okay? This is what creates A, the sensation of pain and response to pain. This isn't taking into consideration any previous emotional or experience with pain. Okay? Now, when we're looking at pain classifications, and I know this is a little scientific, -y, but everybody knows that is what I always do. I want to have the scientific portion of everything in place. So when we have nociceptive pain, we have stimulation of sensory nerve fibers. We have stimuli approaching or exceeding harmful intensity. That varies based off individual perceptions. We have thermal pain, which is heat or cold. We have mechanical pain, which is crushing, tearing, and we have chemical pain, which can be external burning or internal as well. But then we have a separate category called visceral. Visceral pain is very different. So this is more sensitivity to stretching, loading in the bowels, constipation in the bowels. People don't feel this as quickly sometimes. We have other things called deep somatic type of pain, which is ligaments, tendons, bones, blood vessels, fascia and muscle. And then we have superficial somatic pain, which is like skin sensation. So there's a lot of different ways pain can be encountered. But we also have neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain is, let's say, a diabetic with what's called diabetic neuropathy. So from the diabetes, the nerve fibers have become inflamed and then eventually damaged. And so they have this incredible, sometimes a very incredible type of pain. And you go to your family doctor, you complain of neuropathic pain, they're gonna put you on pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical, because that's the tools in their tool chest, prescription pad and pen. Right? Sometimes they won't even bother. Yeah. yeah. Neuropathy is a slippery slope of narcotic and drug treatment. Once you start somebody on treatment for neuropathy, a lot of times it eventually wears off. You start putting them on non-narcotics, and then eventually that wears off and you have to move to narcotics. So nowadays, a lot of doctors and nurse practitioners, PAs, and naturopaths, if you complain of neuropathy and you're under like the age of 60, they're like, mm, we're not even gonna go there with pharmaceuticals. Learn to live with it. But wouldn't it be nice if they had other modalities to suggest? That's what we're gonna learn today. Then we also have what's called psychogenic pain. Does that mean it's all in their head? That they're making it up? No. A lot of people think that psychogenic pain means you're just making it up. And that's not what it infers. Okay? This is pain that has caused damage and has had prolonged factors such as fear, depression, anxiety. Here's the class. 
Hi, Adeline, can you hear okay? And then we want to discuss momentarily about acute pain versus non-acute. So acute pain is typically associated with, oh my gosh, it just happened. It hurts right now. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Whereas chronic pain can be anything, it has to be a minimum of three months. Typically for a diagnosis, it is six months or more. So it's something that somebody has been dealing with quite a while. Our objective is to make acute pain not turn into chronic pain if possible. Because chronic pain has all those psychological aspects associated with it too. All right. So here's just a basic pain assessment tool. It used to be describe your pain from zero to 10. Zero is no pain. 10 is the worst you could possibly imagine in your life. Well, I also like the face choices. So no pain would be a smiley face. Medium pain would be kind of like, mm, not feeling great. Whereas a 10 would be crying uncontrollably. Okay. So that's a good tool to determine. And we talked also about the causes of pain from a scientific standpoint. But let's take a look at it from a different modality. So you can have pain related to injury, sprain, strain, puncture, fall, laceration, things like that. Thermal, we talked about heat versus cold, but we also have pressure related pain. Somebody who is in a wheelchair 24 hours a day, they have a lot of pressure related pain. We have pain that's related to inflammation, so inflamed joints, inflamed fascia, things like rheumatoid arthritis, other conditions that cause systematic inflammation. And we have pain also related to mobility, or I should say immobility, okay? So let's say you were, oh, you hurt your leg and you had to be in a wheelchair for a month. Your body starts to hurt from not moving it, it's swollen and irritated. And people say, why do my legs hurt so bad? I'll say, because you're not moving. So we have swelling, we have lymph stagnancy, the joints get tired. And then we also have pain related to depression, anxiety, and stress. Who's ever felt actual pain from stress? When you do this, oh and you tighten up and your jaw stiffens up and everything is just tense, triggers headaches, neck pain, same thing with depression. But we're gonna take a look at pain specifically today from a Wata Pitta Kapha perception, okay? So any of you who have already taking, taken the basic anatomy and physiology of Ayurveda, this will make a lot of sense, but I'm gonna make sure to review so it makes full sense for those of you who haven't taken the class. Before we go there, I want to point out that 100 million American adults suffer from not just chronic pain, significant chronic pain, according to national studies. 100 million people are in significant pain right now. Pain affects more people than diabetes and cancer combined. One in five adults are currently in moderate to severe pain. One in five adults are in pain right now. Not just a little, moderate to severe. 50% of people who are in that stage of moderate to severe pain report that they have little or poor control. Okay. So this is something that really needs to be addressed and alternatives need to be there. So there's some more statistics. Um, I do wanna point out that back pain is the leading cause of disability in adults over 45 years old and that more than 26 million adults between the ages of 20 and 64 experience back pain. Okay. 
the folder lead that we learned how to make and a lot of the treatments that we're going to look at or modalities we're going to look at, excellent for that. Excellent. Remember too that if pain isn't controlled, chronic pain can lead to high blood pressure. It can lead to an elevated heart rate, which puts people at an increased rate of cardiovascular disease and heart disease. Chronic pain costs a ton of money to the people who are losing time and wages, to the employer losing productivity, to their family who may have to take time off of work to take care of them, to the two tablets of a narcotic that costs $30, you know, to the TENS unit that had a 30% copay, to the yada, yada, yada. Pain costs people a lot of money sometimes. And chronic pain is the number one cause of long-term disability. Number one cause. Something's wrong with that system that we can't offer some type of medical control. So, we have complications of chronic pain, such as opiate addiction and dependence, medication side effects and complications, physical disability, vocational impairment, can't work or can't do their normal job. I see this all the time in my work home practice, all the time. Like police officers will come in and they're like, am I gonna get retired out of my job? It's a possibility. Emotional suffering, social isolation. People who are in a lot of pain oftentimes do not want to socialize. And they're oftentimes grumpier or more emotional because they're trying to deal and stay, you know, scave off that pain response. Chronic pain also leads to an increased risk of suicide. Okay? As well as increased use of illegal drugs and alcohol abuse. Anything to take care of their pain. I'll have patients come in, I'll say, how are you doing with those Norcos I gave you? And they'll say, I prefer some whiskey and Robitussin. I'm like, um, <laughs> okay, you know, and pain leads people to do things that they might not normally do. So we have to remember that. And then financially, there's some statistics here on the financial burden of chronic pain. You can read that on your own. So, what are the options um, when you're in this much pain? You go to your insurance covered family doctor, right? Mm -hmm. Insurance covered. Usually the option is surgery, physical therapy. Chiropractor is covered now on most insurances. You might have a big copay. Also acupuncture is often covered nowadays. That's about it, okay? You can get analgesics. Analgesics are painkillers, so we're looking at ibuprofen, aspirin, excedrin, furacet. You can do narcotic drugs, hydrocodone, narco, codeine, morphine, oxycontin. Let me get the laundry list. Pull the book out. There's plenty of them. You can do steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. So you're looking at prednisone, solumedrol, which have a huge host of long-term complications and side effects. Or you can do non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like naproxen, ibuprofen, Celebrex, Mobix, Tordol. You're gonna get side effects eventually from those two. They can affect the kidney, talk about a stomach ulcer, gastritis. Then you have muscle relaxants, oh yeah. Those are a big ticket on the pharmaceutical edge. So you've got different muscle relaxants such as baclofen, soma, cyclobenzaprine, valium, robaxin. They're addictive, they're sedating, they make you feel like you're just completely doped out. Sometimes, not everybody. And then you have neuropathy drugs. So drugs that help for neurolog uh, neuropathic pain diabetic neuropathy, things like gabapentin, Lyrica, got a whole host of side effects related to those too. And then topical ointments and creams. It's rare that a family doctor is going to prescribe or go through the time to tell you, you know, you could go to the drugstore and pick up Arnica and this and this and this. They've got about 10 minutes to see you. Treat them and street them. That's what we used to say in the ER. 
And it's not that we didn't love and care and have compassion. It's a never ending bus of people pulling up through that ambulance bay. It never ends 24 hours a day. You need to get in there, find out the key complaint and treat them. You don't have time to sit there and tell them about how to make a polka leaf. You have no time to talk about the emotional, the social aspects. It's just not there. The other answer is refer to pain management. Yeah, it's a mandatory. And it's a big job to take care of people's chronic pain, a big job. Because it doesn't go away. It's not going anywhere, anywhere fast. Unless you do a quick fix, Norco. Right? And then you have to work with that person years later when they're addicted to eight a day and they're going through serious, hardcore withdrawals. Okay? What are some natural pain alternatives? I want to point out the fact, yogasana, yoga. When I first started my yoga teacher training, I had severe back pain sometimes. I have a herniated disc at L4, L5. L5S1. And about 30% of the time, my right foot was numb, a portion of it. And I had upward towards about a 6 to 8 out of 10 pain on a bad day. I started doing yoga, strengthened my core, elongated my spine, made more space, more strength. Mm, back pain is very rare now. But you have to start them off slow and with a loving and caring yoga teacher or yoga class. So definitely recommend stretching at minimum and a regular yoga practice is excellent for pain when it's musculoskeletal and emotional. We all know that yoga goes way beyond the physical practice. Fascia release occurs during yogasana. So when we're doing yoga, stretches, exercise, we're releasing that stuck fascia that's rubbing and inflamed, causing pain. We end up giving the body strengthening, which is imperative to prevent further musculoskeletal degeneration. We also have the tools to give them pranayama, breath control. A lot of my patients at the hospital, they get links on how to do breath control, breath regulation, because when we're in pain, how do we breathe? <laughs> that causes a whole cascade of problems. The fight and flight reaction, the epinephrine, norepinephrine from the parasympathetic nervous system. It causes cortisol levels to go up in the body, AKA more inflammation down the road. So we want to teach them relaxation breath techniques. Excellent one, alternate nostril breathing, basic abdominal breathing, just teaching them breath awareness. Sometimes I tell people, just take 20 deep breaths every two hours. And they're like, I can do that. I can do that. We want to encourage things like meditation. A lot of studies show that people in chronic pain, post-meditation, pain perception goes down. Did it cure their condition or change their condition? No. It changed their nervous system and their perception and degree of pain. Okay. Diet is a big one. We'll talk about that according to Wata Patakafa. And then we're going deeper into Ayurveda. We need to look at correcting the person's agni. And Agni is the metabolic factor, not only in the gut, because we know a lot of inflammation starts in the gut, but also the metabolic factors in all the other tissues. So let's take, for instance, somebody who's been in chronic pain for five years and they haven't been able to work out their musculoskeletal system. And their daku, or tissue level of fat, has gone up but the muscle ratio has gone down and the bone nourishment has gone down, they're going to have more problems with chronic pain. So we have to change the distribution of the tissue metabolism. People say, I'm in too much pain to work out. I'll say, good luck with that. <laughs> You're gonna be in more pain. 
And then we can look at different herbs and spices to also do some correction. And we'll talk about all of those.